following program was a production of the Fairfax Network, Fairfax County Public Schools, funded in part by the Virginia Satellite Educational Network. Author. My name is Della Kidd and I'm here at the MTA studio. Joining me today is biologist, world traveler, and award-winning author Sneed Collard. He'll be sharing his ideas about the writing process and talking about his books. Many of you will know my guest through his nonfiction books such as Pocket Babies and Other Amazing Marsupials, Teeth, Wings, The Prairie Builders, Reconstructing America's Lost Grasslands, his science adventure series, and many more. But did you know that he also writes fiction books? We'll be talking about his latest novels, Dog Sense and Flashpoint today. Sneed, welcome. Thanks for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks. It's going to be a great show. And we do have a great show planned for today. This is a live presentation, and in just a few minutes, we're going to open up our phone lines to welcome your questions. Our number nationally is one 800 231 6359. If you're calling us locally, you may reach us at 703-978-1636. Sneed, we've received many email questions from students about you and your book, so let's get started with a few. Sounds great. Good. This email question is from Alyssa. She's from Blacksburg, Virginia, and she writes, Dear Mr. Collard, who or what got you interested in writing, and did you always know you wanted to be a writer? Alas, no, I did not know I wanted to be a writer. In fact, when I was a kid, I thought I might grow up to be a fireman or an airline pilot or something like that. But I was an avid reader growing up, and that's probably due to some great teachers, but also my dad had a lot to do with that. Uh, when I was about eight years old, my parents got divorced, and I used to have to travel to Florida to visit my dad every summer. So oftentimes I would go there and he'd put me to work in his laboratory or something like that. Uh, but often I would also sneak away to the library and I would spend hours and hours reading. And so those seeds of being a writer were there, but I really had no idea that's what I would do. We have a picture of you with a big net. Tell yes. us about this picture. Yes, well this is at the lab at the University of West Florida, and uh, it's the place that I hung out a lot with my dad. He'd put me to work sometimes helping him build nets or dissecting fish, things like that. So it, was he a scientist? He is. Uh -huh. He's a uh, just recently retired uh -huh. professor at, at marine biology. Fascinating. What an interesting, rich background you have to give fun. you ideas for your stories, too. Fun. We um, There's a question here that we want to know um, uh, whether you became a biologist or a writer, which came first for you. How did you take these two interests and blend them together? There's a lot of rich experiences there. Well, again, you know, by the time I finished high school, I was not thinking about being a writer at mm -hmm. all. I studied marine biology in college. But a couple things had started to happen by then that I were in my subconscious. Mm -hmm. One is I started keeping a journal when I was 15 because my stepfather, who's one of the world's experts on fireflies, took me and my mom to Asia with him. And I was so amazed by this, I started writing in a journal. But I was also writing hundreds of letters to my father and friends mm -hmm. all during my childhood. So the writing habit was strongly in me. And when I finally graduated in marine biology and realized I didn't want to just do that for my life, uh, being a writer was something that was a natural decision to start making. I hope you were able to hold on to so many of those journals. I did. <laughs> I've still got them all. <laughs> That's yep. great. Our next email question is from Mary. She is from Bernardsville, New Jersey. And she writes, Dear Mr. Collard, how do you do the research for your science books? Well, I do research like you guys do research. I go out there to libraries. I check out books mm -hmm. by experts. I look up magazine articles, but my favorite way to do research is actually to go into the field. Mm -hmm. And that's selfish because I enjoy doing that anyway, but it also gives me a unique look at what's going on with these scientists. And you pick up things just by being around the science that you can't from books. 
and I know you've done a lot of research with the, the water and uh, underwater life and all of that. We're going to be taking a look at a picture here. Would you give us a description of what we're looking at? Sure. This is Lizard Island. It's a place I visited on the Great Barrier Reef mm -hmm. back in 1998 to write a, kind of an older level book called Lizard Island mm -hmm. uh, about scientists and their work. And one of the, one, the amazing things about these trips is that I go to write a specific book, but I often get a lot of other great ideas, like my picture book, One Night in the Coral Sea, came from that trip to Lizard Island. Mm. We have a picture of a scuba diving, I believe. Is this you in this picture? That is me. Yep. This pr probably with some giant potato cod, which is one wow. of the fun uh, things you can do when you're out there, too. And also, we were, you were, we were talking before the show, you talked about experiences in a submarine? Yeah, about uh, right at 2001, mm -hmm. I was invited to go out with a scientist named Dr. Edith Witter, mm -hmm. a wonderful person who studies marine bioluminescence, and she uses these kinds of deep sea submersibles to, do to look at these animals underwater. And she invited me to spend three days off the Bahama Islands diving with her 3,000 feet deep to look at these animals for myself. We call that hands-on research. Hands-on <laughs> yeah. research, yep. <laughs> Through all of your research, what is the most unusual fact that you've learned? That's a hard question. Well, it's, it's hard and it's not hard. The most unusual fact that I've learned is that every place is interesting. It doesn't matter whether you're out in the middle of Kansas or if you're climbing a fig tree in mm -hmm. the tropical rainforest. You will always find something fascinating if you just keep your eyes open and look. And that's probably the greatest lesson I've learned. Every part of this planet is just mind-blowing if you give it the attention it deserves. Observe it and use those journals. Exactly. Those notes. Yep. We have an email from Springfield, Virginia from Andrew. And he writes, Dear Mr. Collars, <laughs> what were some of the challenges you faced going from being a nonfiction writer to a fiction writer? Well, that is a tough question, but it was eased a little bit by the fact that in my nonfiction books, I always look for a story, an arc, mm -hmm. to carry the book from the beginning to the end, and that's kind of plot-like. So in my fiction, it came naturally mm -hmm. to look for stories. Now, I would say the biggest challenges moving from nonfiction to fiction for me are character development. But voice is not that difficult for me, and I, I cre credit that to all the journal writing growing up, you know, developing a strong voice, doing that. But I would say the biggest thing for fiction for me is developing believable, fun characters. And they are believable. <laughs> uh, that question is a perfect lead in to talk about your fiction novels, Dog Sense and Flashpoint. Thoroughly enjoyed reading both of them. Thank you. Um, let's start with Dog Sense. For our viewers who might not have had an opportunity yet to read the story, could you give us a brief overview? Sure. Dog Sense, I credit totally to my own border collie named Maddie, who I got from the Humane Society about 10 years ago in Missoula. And I knew nothing about border collies, but I learned right away that they are incredibly smart mm -hmm. and they need a lot of activity. So I had this dog, and one of my neighbors suggested, well, does this dog know how to catch Frisbees? And I thought, I don't know. So I went inside, got a Frisbee. Within five minutes, this dog was sailing through the air after these Frisbees. And a few weeks later, the same neighbor suggested taking her to a Frisbee catching and contest. And I believe we're looking at Maddie in a Frisbee exactly. contest now. Exactly. Okay. Now, I have to admit, I did not, we did not do well in the contest. But seeing how passionate mm -hmm. people were about their Frisbee catching dogs gave me the idea, hmm, there's a story in here somewhere. Because I've never seen it. Very vividly in dog sense. Thank you. Um, yeah. Brief overview of Flashpoint for those who might not have read it yet. Flashpoint started uh, with a nonfiction book that I was writing called Birds of Prey. And when I was writing that, I was kind of a bird idiot. Mm -hmm. I didn't know a whole lot about these birds. But fortunately, I had met a woman named Kate Davis, who is very similar to Kay in the book Flashpoint. She's not a vet, but she rehabilitates injured raptors. And if possible, she lets them go again. Mm -hmm. So Kate invited me out to her raptor ranch. And I went out there, and I was just taken, I fell in love with these raptors. And I started thinking, how could I incorporate them into a story? At the same time, Montana was having one of our worst fire seasons ever. I'd been through fires a lot growing up in California. In fact, my mom's whole neighborhood burned down mm. about 15 years ago. So I always wanted to incorporate fire into a novel as well. And I thought, 
Why not throw everything together? Raptors, fire, and a logging town that is struggling with changing economic realities. Well, now that we have a, a little bit of an understanding of both of the storylines, let's take a few email questions sure. about Dog Sense and Flashpoint. Uh, this is from Kyle in Stewart, Florida, uh -huh. and he writes, Dear Mr. Collard, I noticed that in both novels, the main characters, Guy and Luther, don't exactly have an ideal family situation, and they have to deal with bullying in school. Are the boy characters based on you or someone you know? They are based on me in a sense. I did not have an ideal family situation growing up. A lot of kids don't. And, but also, I was bullied several times, especially in junior high mm -hmm. school, early high school. And almost everyone I knew was bullied at some point during their experiences in school. So I wasn't trying to write novels about bullying, but this just came up as a natural experience mm -hmm. that almost everyone has some kind of conflict like this in school. Certainly, Guy and Luther, they're very realistically portrayed, and I'm sure so many of your readers can identify with some elements. Girl readers and boy readers can identify with elements in the storylines of both. You know, as a teacher, especially female teachers, it's kind of hard for um, them to find the, the right reading material to hook the male readers, the male students in their classrooms. Um, Dog Sense and Flashpoint do a beautiful job with that. Thank you. Uh, but there are other resources that we need to hook students, and school librarians can be a big help for that as well. Absolutely. Here's what one school is doing to encourage their male students to read. Let's take a look. Guys Read is an after-school book club at Liberty Middle School in Centerville, Virginia. The book club is loosely based on author John Sheska's web-based book club of the same name. Librarian Paulette Miller implemented the idea at Liberty. She provides the meeting space, recommends possible books, procures the books, but does not participate in the discussions. That is left to the male teachers. So we've got two books here, both written by Sneed Collard. One is Dog Sense, as some of us read, and others read Flashpoint. One thing that seems to be in both books is bullying. The Guys Read Book Club is a simple concept. It's a book club for boys only. The premise is that boys would enjoy reading and would likely read more if they were allowed to pick the books they wanted to read and then discuss. Well, how did the character in Flashpoint deal with it? He got so angry. He fought against the bully, but lost. I can kind of relate to Luther. Because this year, the Guys the Read Book Club became part of Liberty Middle School's extensive after-school program, which has over 40 clubs and activities for students to choose from. And these guys choose to read. Many of the boys who were in the club last year have returned, recruiting some friends along the way. By the end of each book discussion, the boys have worked up quite an appetite and are ready to devour the next book. a great idea to have a book club for guys. Absolutely. I wish I had one of those <laughs> when I was a kid. It, it is a terrific idea. I'm hoping a few more schools will be inspired to have similar programs. We're here today with author Sneed Collard, and we are live. Our phone lines are open and ready to take your calls. Our number nationally is 1-800-231-6359. If you're calling us locally, you may reach us at 703-978-1636. All right, Sneed, let's take a few more email questions. Sure. This question is from Jill, and she's in Colorado. Her question is, I love dogs and liked reading about them in your novels. How were you able to detail the characteristics of Streak in Dog Sense and Roadkill in Flashpoint so well? Well, that was a gift, really, because every time I needed any inspiration for both of these dogs, all I had to do was look at my dog, Maddie. Mm -hmm. You know, if I, how am I going to describe this dog? I'd just look down at her. She'd be sitting next to my desk. This is a great and picture of Maddie, I believe. <laughs> you can see she has a lot of character, yeah. so it wasn't hard to develop a, a good dog character with her. And you talked a, a little bit earlier about your portrayal of Kay, the veterinarian yes. in, in Flashpoint. Um, and that she was based, uh, is, is she is based on Kate? I Kate you Davis, about yes, Kate. Mm -hmm. absolutely. And Kate is just a wonderful, energetic character, and she takes injured raptors into schools all the time. Is this Kate That's holding That's Kate mm -hmm. holding her, uh, her raptor, mm -hmm. her 
a falcon sal, uh -huh. who uh -huh. it was also the name of yeah. the falcon in Flashpoint, yeah, too. So it, was, it was an integral character to that story. Yes, absolutely. All right, it's neat. I have to ask you, you used the word raptor in your novel Flashpoint. You've used it several times while we've been sitting here talking, and that word raptor, my experience with it has been the, the really, really scary dinosaur creatures <laughs> in Jurassic Park. Right. So, clearly that's not what you're talking about. No, Explain to us what a raptor really is. When most scientists think of raptors, they think of birds of prey. Mm -hmm. There are daytime raptors, hawks and eagles, things like that. And nocturnal raptors like owls, of course. So it was really unfortunate that Jurassic Park came up with that as an association because really for almost everyone else mm -hmm. in the scientific world, the raptor is a bird of prey. How much research did you have to, to conduct for raptors for the book Flashpoint? Quite a bit. I Not only did I do the background research for my book Birds of Prey, my nonfiction book, but I went out and I met with Kate several times. I also called up a falconer in Montana and went out and watched him actually fly his bird to get an idea of how this actually works. He's the one I got the ideas for just stuffing pigeons right. in your pockets mm -hmm. and throwing them up in the air for this, these raptors to hunt and to uh, practice their hunting skills with. Let's go to another email question. Sure. This is from Sarah in Rockville, Maryland. And she writes, Dear Mr. Collard, why do you know so much about forest fires? <laughs> I know a lot about forest fires, mostly just from living in highly flammable places <laughs> all of my life. <laughs> Southern California, of course, uh, some of my earliest memories are of watching the mountains burn mm -hmm. up there. But it also got me interested because these mountains are supposed to burn. The reason we have such catastrophic fires in so many parts of our country is because we've suppressed fires for so long that the fuel loads are just huge. And you really come face to face with that when you live in these fire mm -hmm. zones. Because these places, they should be burning every few years, but now they're only burning every 50 to 100 years. So it's something that I really mm -hmm. care about and would like to promote more of, responsible burning instead of waiting for disastrous fires. To come and through. you talk about that, the, the storyline, the, the story Flashpoint is based in, in the town of Hartwood. Right. And a lot of perspective is brought into the storyline, lots of points of view. Talk to us a little bit about that and how you wove that into the story, points of view on forest fire and conservation. Sure. Well, when I first moved to Montana, I was struck by all these little communities, each of which depended mostly on one resource or one activity. And at the same time, many of these resources are starting to go away. Like in forestry, a lot of the big mm -hmm. old growth logs have been cut, and so the mills often couldn't handle new ones. Or they've been locked up, the forest have been locked up for protection or conservation mm -hmm. purposes. And so at the same, you know, I applauded many of these efforts to protect the forest. At the same time, I really felt for people who are caught in the middle. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a lot of times they are blaming the government on locking up the last few stands of forest that have not been cut. But really, if they had been managing these resources in a more sustainable way, when I say they, I don't mean the workers, I mean the companies who are in charge of these factories, then they would still have jobs and a lot of these issues would not be happening right now. Could have been avoided. So I, f I feel for both sides and I wanted to look at both sides of the it issues was, too. It was clearly represented. Yeah, okay. um, we have another email. This is from Zoe and mm -hmm. Zoe is from Port St. Lucie, Florida. She wants to know, what made you decide to write for young people? Ah, that's ah, a good question. Yeah. In fact, when I started writing, I had no idea what I was going to do. I wrote some really bad novels for adults and things like that. But after a few years, I, I tried an article for science uh, for Highlights for Children, mm, a science a great article. Magazine. It is a great magazine. Uh, Kent Brown, the publisher, was very mm. encouraging for me to do that. And so that was really the first big door that opened for me. And I found I loved writing for young people. Plus, I feel like young people will actually listen to new ideas. And a lot of times, adults are, they pretty much know what they think already. And so I thought my resources would be better aimed at young people. So. One of the questions our students always want to know is, how long did it take you to get your first book published? Oh, it took mm -hmm. me about 10 years to get my first book published. I was writing a lot of articles and, mm -hmm. and stories and things like that, and writing a lot of books. I'll bet I had 15 books rejected that never sold before I sold my first one. 
But I got lucky right when I was starting to uh, write nonfiction science books. Mm -hmm. Kent Brown, who I mentioned earlier, called me up and said that Highlights was starting a book publishing company, asked me if I wanted to write a book for them, and that became my first book, Sea Snakes. Sea Snakes. Yep. All right. That was going to be my next question. <laughs> what is your routine, writing routine like? Every writer has a different approach. I used mm -hmm. to have a routine, mm -hmm. and then I had children. <laughs> I have a one-year-old and a five-year-old. So my routine basically yeah. is to get my five-year-old off to school, then usually and get Maddie walked because Border Collies need a lot of exercise. She's definitely high energy. <laughs> I definitely. So usually I start my serious writing about 9 o'clock in the morning. Mm -hmm. And I write till 12 or 1 or sometimes 2 if I'm really on a roll, take a break for lunch, mm -hmm. sometimes have a nap, which, by the way, is the best thing about writing, getting to take a nap. I call them nap. power naps. The power <laughs> naps. I'm going to stop you there for just sure. a minute. We have a caller. Great. Tell us your name and what is your question today for Sneak. Hello. Hello. Um, I have a question for Sneak caller. caller. What is your name? Kareem. Hi, Kareem. What is your name with your question for Sneak? Um, I have a question about Luther. Like, what inspired you to create his character? Well, Luther was inspired by uh, a lot of the aspects of Luther are kind of my own characteristics. But Luther is also someone who I wanted to be questioning what's going on in the town that he lives in. A lot of the rest mm -hmm. of the town already has their minds made up about what they think. But Luther, because of his experience working with these birds of prey, has started to think in different ways. And so I wanted a character who is just really feeling out, thinking for himself for the first time. And, but I'd have to say most of the characteristics in Luther probably are characteristics that I have as well. Thanks for calling, Kareem. Sneed, what is your, the most challenging part of the writing process for you? I would say the most challenging part of the writing process, especially for fiction, mm -hmm. is developing characters, believable characters. And in fact, I should have been doing this all along, but I've recently just started keeping a little notebook in my pocket mm -hmm. about whenever I see an interesting aspect of a person to write down. But also developing a plot that's believable. A lot of beginning writers, they, they start out with a scene or uh, a place that they'd like to write about, but they don't have a compelling story in their mind. And that's something I've gotten better at over the years. But it's still challenging to come up with a compelling plot that will keep people moving, keep readers moving through the story. One, th one similarity between the two novels is the, the dialogue among uh, the, the people, between the, the students among themselves, the peers, as well as the, um, the main characters and their parents. Yes. And, and so the adult-child interactions. And the dialogue is very believable. How do you approach developing dialogue? Probably the thing that I do most is just by respecting all the parties involved. Uh, I was very fortunate in that even though my parents were divorced, I had a very good relationship mm -hmm. with my father. And he always spoke to me with a great deal of respect. He didn't talk down to me or anything like that. And I tried to have the adults in the books talk to the younger people in believable ways. And of course, I still have many of my own conversations and voices of my own friends that I grew up with, many of whom I still know. And so that helps a lot, I think. Very thing. effective. We have a call. What is your name today and what is your question for Snead? Um, my name is Diego. Hi, Diego. Um, when you were bullied, bullied in school, what did you do? And what advice do you have for kids who are bullied today? Bullying is such a tough issue, Diego. It's, it's hard to know exactly how to handle it. And I would say for a couple of years, I did not handle it. I just got bullied and tried to stay away from these bullies. Uh, to be honest, what I ended up doing was I started learning martial arts. And the next time I was bullied, I had been practicing so much that my reflex was just to hit the person that was bullying me. And that amazingly and unfortunately put an end to the bullying. Uh, but, you know, you don't want to encourage people to be swinging at each other out there. But unfortunately, it's hard to get the respect from bullies unless you show you can stand up for yourself. So it's a really tough issue, and there's no magic bullet for it. Okay, thanks for calling. Uh, we have an email from Kate from Newport News, Virginia, and she writes, Dear Mr. Collard, 
Are you working on any new novels or science books? I am. I always have a slew of science books coming out, but one of the novels I just finished revising is called Double Eagle, and I took my whole family to southern Alabama to research this in November. We went to a place called the Dauphin Island uh, Sea Lab, which is a great marine lab, and it's also a place that I spent part of my own youth. My father, there's a picture of my son at the marine lab a couple of months ago, and it was an old military base that had got turned into a sea lab. And my father taught there when I was 13 and mm -hmm. 14 years old, and I always wanted to set a novel there, but it took me about 30 years to come up with a good plot for it. So I give us a sneak peek? Absolutely. <laughs> uh, one thing I did when I was a teenager is I made a really good friend there uh, named uh, Scott Daniels, and he showed me how to sneak into the Civil War fort next door. So we used to sneak in through one of the old cannon ports this there. This is a cool picture. Tell us about that. That is Fort Gaines, mm -hmm. which is the Civil War fort mm -hmm. that's right next to the Sea Lab. And we used to sneak into these, these kind of weird rooms you weren't supposed to go into. Now, recently, I started uh, coin collecting with my son. This is something I did as a kid, and I started doing the state quarters collecting mm -hmm. with my son. And so I started reading about coins, and I thought, hmm, what if these kids sneak into this fort and they find a $20 gold piece, but not just any $20 gold piece, which is a, called a double eagle. Mm -hmm. What if they found one minted by the Confederacy? Now, these are not known to exist, but the Confederacy did mint some half dollars with their own designs on the back. Well, I thought, if they found a, a gold piece like this, it would be almost priceless. And oh, 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 and what if someone offshore happens to be looking for this treasure in a sunken ship full of gold? And the boys start thinking, hey, it's not out there in that sunken ship. It's somewhere in this fort. So that's the basic plot outline for oh, the story. Well, I'll be looking forward to reading that one. Thank that's exciting. You. Should be out next year. Yep. Very good. Well, we're getting close on time. Before we go, though, what advice do you have for aspiring writers? Well, two things. One, go out and live. If you haven't lived, if you haven't experienced things, you're not going to have anything compelling to write about. Travel, try new experiences, take risks. Not dumb risks, mm -hmm. but risks. The other thing, start keeping a journal. When I started writing my nonfiction, one of the reasons it began standing out was because it had voice, and I thought, it does? I didn't know that, but looking back on it, what gave me that voice was spending years writing in a journal. you learning how to express yourself, and that gave me a distinctive voice. And voice really only comes from thousands of hours of writing, so that's the other advice I'd give young writers. Practice it. Practice, <laughs> Absolutely. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. It has been great having you on the show today. It's been my pleasure. Thank you very much. Our guest today has been author Sneed Collard. If you would like to learn more about his books or upcoming school visits, Check out his website at www.sneedbcollardthe3rd.com. And to check out our upcoming authors and programs, visit us at www.fcps.edu slash Fairfax Network. For the Fairfax Network, I'm Della Kidd. Keep reading, keep writing, and keep dreaming.